Good day and thank you for standing by. Welcome to the second quarter 2023 Great Lakes Dredge and Dock Corporation Earnings Conference Call. At this time, all participants are in listen-only mode. After the speaker's presentation, there will be the question and answer session. To ask a question during the session, you will need to press star 11 on your telephone keypad. You will then hear an automatic message advising your hand is raised. To withdraw your question, please press star 11 again. Please be advised that today's conference has been recorded. I would not like to hand the conference over to our first speaker today, Tina Baginskis. Please go ahead. Good morning and welcome to our second quarter 2023 conference call. Joining me on this call this morning is President and Chief Executive Officer Lassa Pedersen and our Chief Financial Officer Scott Kornblau. Lassa will provide an update on the events of the quarter, then Scott will continue with an update on our financial results for the quarter. Lassa will conclude with an update on the outlook for the business and the market. Following their comments, there will be an opportunity for questions. During this call, we will make certain forward-looking statements to help you understand our business. These statements involve a number of risks, uncertainties, and other factors that could cause actual results to differ materially from our expectations. Certain risk factors inherent in our business are set forth in our earnings release and in filings with the SEC, including our 2022 Form 10-K and subsequent filings. During this call, we also refer to certain non-GAAP financial measures, including adjusted EBITDA, which are explained in the net income to adjusted EBITDA reconciliation attached to our earnings release and posted on our investor relations website, along with certain other operating data. With that, I will turn the call over to Lassa. Thank you, Tina. As we indicated in our last earnings call, the difficulties we faced in 2022 as a result of the severely delayed bid market for capital and beach restoration projects is now slowly coming to an end. The second quarter EBITDA is a result of an improved bid market and our cost-saving initiatives, which resulted in improved project margins. All combined, these resulted in an adjusted EBITDA of 16.6 million, our highest EBITDA since the first quarter of 2022. Although not all of the challenges from 2022 are behind us, we continue to see positive developments in both a large number and a better mix of projects coming to bid, which provides us with confidence that we are on a path to return to normal operations and results towards the latter part of 2023 and into 2024. The total bid market through June 30, 2023 was 930 million of which we won 310 million or 33% of the total uh, market bid. This is nearly three times the amount won by the next closest peer. The first half year bid market saw several bids for port deepening and improvement projects, totaling 350 million of which we won 56%, including the 160 million pre-port phase two projects on which we will utilize a varied suite of dredging equipment that only Great Lakes can provide. We ended the quarter with 434 million of a dredging backlog, which does not include approximately $50 million of performance obligations related to offshore wind contracts and 487 million in low bids and options pending award. Included in the low bids pending award were two LNG projects that have been waiting notice to proceed from our clients. In July, post-quarter end, we received notice to proceed on the Rio Grande LNG projects, which will be now the largest project undertaking in 133-year history. Work on establishing the dredge material containment areas is scheduled to start later this year, with the major dredging network starting in early 2024 and ongoing for the next two years. Additionally, as stated previously, we've seen an increase in bids coming to the market, and post-quarter end, we were low bidder on an additional 137 uh, million of projects, which will likely be awarded an added to backlog during the third quarter, together with the Rio Grande LNG project, resulting in a total backlog exceeding 900 million today when all these projects have been included for and awarded. As we stated, the company took swift and proactive action on cost reductions and fleet utilization adjustments. Last year, we retrieved the 42-year-old Hopper Dresden Terrapin Island, 
And we currently had a cold stack dredges and various support equipment in anticipation of an improved dredging market in the latter part of 2023 and onwards. As we previously stated, cold stack vessels can easily be reactivated as the market continues to improve. These initiatives have led to substantially reduced costs in 2023, which has allowed us to navigate impacts from the delayed 2022 bid market. Correspondingly, we have reduced our GNA and overhead cost structures by more than 15%, adjusting to the current market conditions. On July 20 this year, we were honored to have President Biden attend the steel cutting ceremony for Great Lakes offshore wind rock installation vessel, the Acadia. President Biden was joined by Congresswoman Mary Gay Scanlon, Marriott Administrator Rear Admiral Ann Phillips, Metal Trace Department AFLCIO Jimmy Hart, and President of SIU Dave Hindem, SIU Crew R. Hopper Dredges. Also present were senior executives from our current and potential clients. Post quarter end, we signed the first ever subcontract for procurement of US sourced rock with Carver Sand and Gravel LLC from a quarry in the state of New York. Both milestones solidify our entry into the offshore wind market and will support Great Lakes of awarded rock installation contract with Equinor for the Empire Wind 1 and 2 projects with installation windows in 2025 and 26. As we continue to adjust to the current market situation, we remain optimistic in the long-term outlook for the dredging market and our ongoing fleet renewal program is fundamental in our strategy to continue to be the U.S. dredging industry leader. After decommissioning several of our oldest dredges back in 2020, uh, 2017, we have invested in productivity upgrades to our best performing vessels and our new hopper dredge, the Galveston Island, is expected to be operational in the third quarter of 2023. And her sister ship, the Amelia Island is expected to be delivered in 2025. I now turn the call over to Scott to further discuss the results of the quarter, and then I'll provide a further commentary around the market and our business. Thank you, Lassa, and good morning, everyone. For the second quarter of 2023, revenues were $132.7 million, net income was $1.7 million, and adjusted EBITDA was $16.6 million. Revenue of $132.7 million in the second quarter of 2023 decreased $16.7 million from the prior year's second quarter. The quarter over quarter decrease in revenue was primarily due to lower utilization as the recently retired Terrapin Island worked most of the prior year's second quarter and two currently cold stack dredges that didn't work in the second quarter of 2023 were operating in the same quarter last year. Partially offsetting the decrease in revenue and utilization were less dry docking days in the second quarter of 2023 compared to 2022. Despite the lower quarter over quarter revenue, current quarter gross profit and gross profit margin increased to $17.9 million and 13.5% respectively, compared to $10.5 million and 7% respectively in the second quarter of 2022. The increase in gross margin is primarily due to improved project performance, lower operating costs due to our continued focus on cost reduction, and fewer dry dockings in the current year quarter. In addition, during the quarter, we recorded a $2.4 million benefit to cost related to a legal settlement on a previously completed and closed project. Second quarter 2023 GNA of $14.5 million is $3.7 million higher than the same quarter last year. The increase in general in administrative expenses from the prior year was primarily due to a one-time non-recurring adjustment in the prior year quarter higher office rent due to the expansion of our Houston headquarters and lower incentive pay in the prior year quarter, offset partially by a decrease in headcount and lower legal and recruiting expense. 
Operating income for the current quarter of $3.7 million increased $4 million from the prior year quarter's net loss of $0.3 million driven by the improved gross profit. Net interest expense of $3.2 million for the second quarter 2023 was down slightly from $3.4 million in the second quarter of 2022 primarily due to an increase in capitalized interest related to our new build program, partially offset by current quarter revolver interest expense. Second quarter 2023 net income tax provision of $0.8 million compared to $0.9 million of income tax benefit from the same quarter of 2022 and was driven by the higher current quarter income. Rounding out the P&L, net income for the second quarter 2023 was $1.7 million, up from a $4 million net loss in the prior year quarter. Turning to the balance sheet, we ended the second quarter of 2023 with $42.1 million in cash and $55 million drawn on our $300 million revolver, which doesn't mature until the third quarter of 2027. Total capital expenditures for the second quarter of 2023 were $19.4 million, consisting of $12.5 million for the Amelia Island, $2.9 million for the Multicats, $2 million for the Galveston Island, $1 million for the build of the Acadia, and $1 million for maintenance capex. Full year capex guidance of approximately $175 million remains unchanged, but can increase or decrease depending on the timing of new build milestone payments. As previously discussed in January of this year, we applied with the Maritime Administration or MARAD, which is a unit of the Department of Transportation for Title 11 financing on our new wind vessel, which typically comes with very attractive terms. The review process is ongoing and progressing, but in parallel, we continue to explore other sources of capital. Though our backlog, and more specifically, our capital project backlog is drastically increasing, most of the new work starts towards the end of 2023 and the beginning of 2024, so we will not see a major impact from these projects in the third quarter. Costs will likely increase during the third quarter as we have two dredges that will be in the shipyard undergoing their regulatory dry dockings. Both dredges are expected to return to work in the fourth quarter. Also, during the third quarter, we will have a previously cold stack dredge in the shipyard for reactivation as she is expected to commence work in the fourth quarter of 2023 on a recently won project. With no further regulatory dry dockings or shipyard stays planned for the remainder of the year, a better mix of capital projects and backlog, and the Galveston Island coming online, the fourth quarter is shaping up nicely, which should provide strong momentum going into 2024. With that, I'll turn the call back over to Lassa for his remarks on the outlook moving forward. Thank you, Scott. We continue to see strong support from the Biden administration and Congress for the dredging industry. In December 2022, the Omnibus Appropriation Bill for fiscal year 23 was signed into law, which included another record budget of $8.7 billion for the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers Civil Works Program, of which $2.3 billion is provided for the Harbor Maintenance Trust Fund to maintain and modernize our nation's waterways. In addition, the Disaster Disaster Relief Supplemental Appropriations Act for fiscal year 23 was approved, which includes $1.4 billion for the Corps to take necessary repairs to infrastructure impacted by hurricanes and other natural disasters, and to initiate beach re-nourishment projects that will increase coastal resiliency. This increased budget and additional funding has resulted in a strong bid market in the first half of 2023 which we expect will continue for the remainder of the year. Support for the dredging market. Supporting the dredging market is also the increase in major works for private clients. As stated previously, we have been awarded next decade's dredging contract for their LNG project in Brownsville, Texas. And earlier in the second quarter, SEMPRA made the FID decision to proceed with the Port Arthur LNG facility, and the award for dredging services is expected to be issued in the next few months. 
In 2021, the Biden administration announced the ambitious goal of 30 gigawatts of offshore wind energy by 2030 and provided $3 billion in federal loan guarantees for offshore wind, in, uh, wind projects. As stated previously, Great Lakes was awarded the rock installation contract for the Empire Wind 1 and 2 projects with installation windows in 2025 and 26. In July of 23, the federal government further showed their support for offshore wind by providing approval for New Jersey's first offshore wind farm to begin construction. And also in July 23, the Department of the Interior issued the final sales notice for the first ever offshore wind lease sale in the Gulf of Mexico, which will take place at the end of August. We have tendered uh, bids for multiple offshore wind projects for rock, in, uh, rock placements in 2025 and beyond to support the work schedule for the Acadia as she starts operation. In conclusion, our main focus this year is to keep managing through the various challenges that the 2022 delayed bid market presented us. As expected, so far this year, we have seen a strong overall dredging market, including bids for a number of large capital projects. This, combined with our fleet adjustments, cost reductions, and productivity initiatives, will ensure we continue to provide improved results for 2023 and onwards. And with that, I turn the call over for questions. Thank you, dear participants. As a reminder, if you wish to ask a question, please press star 1-1 on your telephone keypad and wait for your name to be announced. To withdraw your question, please, please press star 1-1 again. Please stand by, we will compile the Q&A roster. This will take a few moments. Now we're going to take our first question. And the question comes from the line of Adam Thalheimer from Thompson Davis. Your line is open. Please ask your question. Hey, good morning, guys. Congrats on the solid Q2. Um, with the backlog kind of swinging from, you know, lowest... <laughs> lowest in a while in Q1 to probably record um, here in July. When do you think you're going to be fully utilized again? Yeah, so uh, good morning, Adam. Th thanks for the question. So uh, a number of our dredges now are completely booked, not only for this year, but, but well in, into next year. Uh, we have a, a couple of dredges that still have some availability for this year, but that is, that is very, very, uh, very few. Um, Q1 is also getting pretty booked already for next year. So when are we going to get full utilization? That I can't say. Um, I did mention, though, in my prepared remarks, we are uh, in the midst of reactivating a previously cold stacked uh, vessel that will work on one of these uh, recent projects award that will start in the Q4. Um, so it, it is a, a good problem to have where a year ago we were figuring out what we were going to do with dredges. Now we're trying to figure out with this, you know, a lot of work that's coming through, how we're going to get it all in. One of the things I will mention, though, a number of these projects, uh, the reason they're so attractive to us is there's a lot of flexibility in the timing to get them done. So it does, it does allow us to strategically move vessels around and move uh, certain scopes of work to the left and the right to try to fit all of this in. Okay. And then um, these, there were two super jobs that you called out in the release. One was New York, New Jersey deepening, and one was the $30 billion plus Texas job. What are your thoughts on timing of those jobs? Yeah, the uh, the New York is uh, was included in the WERDA, so the studies that the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers are uh, executing is ongoing, and uh, we assume that it, it would take some three to four years before the actual dredging to start. Um, so that's kind of the time perspective. But it's it's important to also have a more longer term view when it comes to these capital projects so that we see that there is a continuation of large projects as we go forward. <clears throat> got it. Got it. And then lastly, the, you had the legal gain in Q2. Um, and then for the last year, we've been talking about, I think it was three jobs with differing site conditions. Are those two things related? Or where, and where do we stand on the differing site conditions? 
Yeah, no, these are these are unrelated. This is a, a from a this one is very old. It's not a claim. It's just an old legal matter uh, that had been uh, settled during the quarter. So just some balance sheet cleanup and, and pick up. Um, the, the claims they they are progressing. Um, of the two larger ones that I've called out, uh, I am I am very comfortable that at least one of those gets closed out in the third quarter. Uh, the second one. Uh, I'm confident if not third quarter, it's fourth quarter. We're, we're making very good progress on both of those. Okay. I'll turn it over. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you. Dear participants, as a reminder, if you wish to ask a question, please press star 1-1 one, one on your telephone keypad. Now we're going to take our next question. And the question comes from the line of Joe Gomez from Noble Capital. Capital, your line is open. Please ask your question. Thanks. Good morning for taking my questions. Good morning, Joe. So I wanted to start out um, on the, the, the core and kind of the, the, the sequencing here of the releases, you know, listening to, you know, one of your main competitors, Last week, they continued to talk about, you know, a, a, a less than normal or less than historical level of award activity out of the core. Uh, and, you know, you guys mentioned some of the capital projects that have been coming in um, that were delayed in 2022, but kind of get a better feel of, of what you guys are seeing or what your per, perception is on the uh, award level of the core, um, and do you think it's it's kind of getting back to a more historical level, or do you still think there's there's more room for uh, upside there? Yeah, what we have seen is that uh, the maintenance projects uh, is coming out as scheduled from the core, and in addition, we have seen an improvement in the capital projects that are coming out. Um, we still see delays on some of the larger dredging projects, uh, but uh, combined now with the, the private uh, client market, uh, the dredging market turns out to be uh, good, and the bid market is good here for 2023. Um, so in, in short, uh, maintenance projects are coming out as scheduled, and uh, some of the, the, the projects or the capital projects uh, has been uh, bid, but there are still some delays. Okay. And on the uh, next decade project, uh, I was wondering if you might be able to talk a little bit more about that. You, know, you, you mentioned it's the largest, and I think you you, you, you did give us some sizing uh, in, in terms of what your previous largest project was. Um, but I don't know how much detail you can go into on that in terms of the stages and, and what kind of, I know the, the revenue flow, I don't know if you can break it down into percentages. Um, have you seen that come in um, for, that, for that project? And, you know, with a couple of these large other capital projects that you have, uh, if you were to, to, to win the, 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 uh, the other LNG, um, you know, how will you stand capacity-wise to be able to do all these at one time? Yeah, the uh, next decade uh, has asked us not to uh, come out with the exact number for, for the project, uh, so we are respecting that. Uh, the project is large. Uh, it's starting up now uh, pretty soon with the, all the preparatory work that we need to do in order to build the containment areas for the dredge material. And then as we get to the end of the year, beginning of next year, we will start uh, with the, the main dredging that then goes on for almost two years. Um, it's, a, it's a very good project. It uh, utilizes our cutter dredges, which uh, the market has been very soft for over the last, let's say, 18 months. Um, <clears throat> there are a couple of other uh, capital, capital projects out there, as I mentioned, uh, that we are bidding and in position to to uh, execute, uh, if we are successful, uh, we have capacity to do those projects as well. So that's not 
a concern on that side. Okay, and then and then one more, if I may, um, just you know, Sky, we could talk a little bit about the capex here. It, you know, we we've, we've talked about the 175 million guide for the year uh, in Q1. It was you know 28.7 million, even though the the, the Initial expectations were north of 70 million. In Q2, it was 19.4 million, even though expectations were 55 million. And that that leads a significant number, you know, roughly let's call it 125 million for the last two quarters here. Um, and and you know, we talked last time we talked. You mentioned some stuff slipping to the right in the first quarter for a couple of weeks, but it seems like it's a lot more than, than that, the whole quarter at least. Um, and maybe you can give us a little more insight as to what is going on um, on, the, on the CapEx spend and, you know, how comfortable are you with the ability, you know, if you are to hit that $175 million with, you know, financing it in the last, you know, kind of rush here in the, in the last two quarters, uh, of the year. Yeah, thank, thanks for the question, Joe. Um, you know, it, it is not unusual on these large capital projects that have milestone payments for, you know, those various milestone payments to, to slip. That is what's happened here. Um, Q3 will be a high uh, CapEx number. We have already made some of those payments that were expected end of June. They happened early July. Um, so, you know, I, I do still stick by the 175. If one of the, you know, December payments slips, and these are big payments, you know, that would, you know, lower that for this year, but increase it for next year. You know, the total amount uh, we have left to spend on the new bill program is still intact. And again, there's going to be these kind of ebbs and flows uh, to, to the left and right. Uh, you know, to answer your, your second question, you know, the timing of this CapEx, you know, whether it was more geared towards the first half of the year or second half of the year, you know, doesn't change the full year, doesn't change the way that, that we were looking at it. Um, even though we are working not only on Title 11, but some other financial alternatives, uh, nothing we need to do right now. Our $300 million revolver you know, had $55 million drawn uh, at the end of the first half, and we had cash on the balance sheet at the time. So, you know, we, we have plenty of liquidity, um, you know, to get us through end of the year into next year, uh, even with these large CapEx programs. And, um, you know, as we mentioned, Q4 and into 24 uh, is looking to be much stronger years, which will uh, help on the cash flow side of things. Okay, great. Thanks for that. I appreciate it. I'll get back in the queue. Thank you. And now we're going to take our next question. Just give us a moment. And the next question comes from Lan of John Tangban Tang from CJS. Your line is open. Please ask your question. Hi, good morning. It's Pete Lucas for John. Uh, you touched on in your uh, prepared remarks in terms of uh, cost reductions. Can you talk a little bit more about how much was uh, permanent cost versus temporary, and what does this mean for your margin potential uh, after Q3 when you return to better utilization and mix? Yeah, yeah so... Uh, Oh, sorry, go, go ahead, Loss. I'll jump in afterwards. Yeah, it's uh, what we have targeted was a, a more than 15% reduction of SG&A and overhead cost, uh, and that's on a permanent basis. So as activity is, is picking up, uh, we will be careful not to add any SG&A, uh, and uh, there may be some overhead cost that needs to come, but I um, look upon this as a permanent saving uh, on an annual basis. Uh, Scott, you want to have some details? Yeah, no, yeah, and then you know specifically for this quarter, um, we did have a dry docking that should have started in Q2. It's going to start in Q3, so we will have some increased costs then. It's just we just didn't have all the equipment. The the dredge is working, so it just shifts. It uh, doesn't really change anything for the year. It's just going to shift some costs. 
uh, at a, in, into, into Q3 instead of Q2, and also the margin that we earned on the vessel, which was fully utilized uh, during the quarter, we'll have to take take her down. I'll also say, you know, not only are we being very, uh, you know, aggressive on a lot of our initiatives that we're doing to reduce costs, if you recall last year, because of the unusual bid market and we had a lot of dredges uh, that were sitting at the dock, we did take advantage of that time to be proactive and invest in the fleet then. So times like now that we're starting to see utilization pick up again, we didn't have to take vessels down. So that also is, you know, what's keeping the cost down. Uh, very helpful. Thanks. And then um, how much is left in potential uh, change order settlements and what is the potential timing uh, on those? Yeah, so, you know, as I mentioned earlier, the ones that we called out last year because they were, you know, unusual by the size uh, that we had, uh, as I just mentioned, I do expect one of those uh, will settle in the third quarter, and the uh, largest of them, if not in the third quarter, uh, we're having very advanced dialogues. Um, that one gets done. Uh, that one, I'd be very surprised if it does not get done this year. Uh, as we had said last year, you know, between the two of them, uh, you know, we're, we're in the uh, you know, teens, uh, you know, millions of dollars. So, you know, these, these were pretty large claims uh, in, in the scope of things. Uh, fortunately, you know, the reason we called them out last year is because they were large uh, in nature and unfortunately hit at the same time. We thought it was an anomaly, and that's holding, and that's holding out true. We have not seen uh, those sort of claims like we did see last year. Uh, very helpful, thanks. And last one for me, um, what can we expect in terms of, uh, what are you seeing in terms of wind signings, and are you expecting Acadia to be working at 100% capacity? Yeah, Acadia is uh, scheduled to come out in 2025, and uh, she goes uh, to work on the Empire Wind project. And uh, in addition to doing the rock installation uh, that is supporting the monopile, uh, we're also seeing a number of bids coming out for protections of clay cables, uh, which will uh, then uh, help with the utilization in addition to the, the main work, which is the foundation's uh, support. Uh, so we are seeing good opportunities for having her fully uh, utilized in 2026 and onwards. Very helpful. Thanks. I'll jump back in the queue. Thank you. There are no further questions at this time. I would now like to hand the conference over to Tina Baginskis for any closing remarks. Thank you. We appreciate the support of our shareholders, employees, and business partners, and we thank you for joining us in this discussion about the important developments and initiatives in our business. We look forward to speaking with you during our next earnings discussion. This concludes today's conference call. Thank you for your participation. You may now disconnect. Have a nice day.